appreciate the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, it's been given once before at uh, the pediatric section of the AANS, the, 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 the group of the pediatric neurosurgeons coming together to study the craniovertebral junction um, was able to get some help and criticism of this and a lot of skepticism. Um, I, uh, um, Joe Pyatt called me out on this slide, which is one of my favorite slides. It, sometimes you feel like you're beating a, your head against a wall and are getting nowhere. Um, but I feel like this, that Sisyphus is still my hero. He keeps rolling the, the boulder up the hill and it keeps falling down and he keeps rolling it up again. So I'm not giving up. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, it, we used to, I used to be in, um, very, very adamant that these were interoperative um, dis, uh, changes in the CV junction. But since Dr. Vera Janapa has joined us, it, it's clear that we can actually, um, for the most part, we can do this um, at the time of positioning and don't have to do interoperative uh, changes while we're operating most of the time. This was a, a boy who uh, was about 18 months old when I met him first. He had had two previous um, uh, Chiari decompressions and he um, was getting worse every, every time. And so what I noticed was that they, and there wasn't, the, the radiology reports didn't say anything about it, but it looked like there was a stake right in, uh, into his uh, brainstem. And um, I had done some work in the cadaver laboratory uh, to show about the movements of the uh, occiput and the odontoid process and showed that they were, in most patients, they were, it was a reducible thing. So at the time of uh, surgery, we actually um, put his head back and, and created a straight CV uh, craniovertebral uh, junction. And um, that, that actually worked great. And uh, so this had, as far as I could tell, this had not been recognized before as something that was happening. Besler and vagination, at the time the radiologists are, are talking about the odontoid process going within the frame and magnum, not pushing the brain stem back. So this is usually not identified. So the, I'm gonna present a series of, um, we've had 94, in, in a, a two-year period had 94 um, patients with um, occipital cervical instability, distor anterior distortion of the craniovertebral junction and the brainstem. And uh, so um, Ezio de Rocco calls it the Chiari-1 anomaly rather than the Chiari-1 uh, malformation because it really is an anomaly. It's, it's, it, the malformation means that it, it occurs in utero, but uh, it probably, uh, in many cases, doesn't. It comes later. So the patients uh, had at least a five millimeter descent of the cerebellar tonsils, and abnormal move measurements of uh, occipital cervical instability using the measurements that you just saw of the of the um, cranio uh, uh, cranioaxial angle and the um, PBC2 or Grab Oaks line. They all suffered from severe neck pain and headaches with mechanical worsening. So the, in, in New York, you can always tell because they're, these are people that start screaming when they hit a pothole. Um, their, their pain is exacerbated by specific movements. And they have a Karnofsky score. These are self, uh, Dr. Long told us about how these are um, um, given by the patients. Um, but uh, all of the patients underwent a uh, trial uh, with, a, with a rigid cervical collar in the erect position of time, and they showed it, it, a lot of the patients wouldn't take the collars off. Uh, they were, they were, there was so much pain involved in this. Um, so to be clear for everybody, these are all patients who are suffering with pain. They are not in imminent danger of death or severe neurologic deficits. Uh, it's functional neurosurgery. All patients had restriction of the quality of life. Many of them didn't leave the house. Um, but the only neurologic deficits or problems that were done in selecting patients for this treatment were the severe pain and the neurologic things that were specifically related to the Chiari. We didn't use other things that, are, that they wanted me to deal with. 
I dealt with in discussing with them, but I never, the, it was to be clear to them and to you that these were all done um, with the mechanical nature of the, of the neck pain. So this article um, opened a floodgate. It was there, it was before I got to the Chiari Institute, but the problems of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and I, I don't know whether you had articles before this or not, Fraser, but I know that you and he sort of dis dis discovered it at a similar time, uh, and I don't know who gets credit, but I, I know that Tom Millerat's article opened the floodgates and uh, a large number of uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility patients uh, found themselves with Chiari's and s flocked to the Chiari Institute as a result of, of this. He had read my my discussion of how to do the interoperative reduction uh, in a textbook that, uh, that was published in 2001. So these are, most of the people in this room know about the Baton score. It's a, it's, there's no biomarker for EDS type three. Uh, you have to do a clinical examination and uh, you get one for being able to touch your uh, palms to the floor um, without bending your knees and uh, one each for each extremity um, with the either the uh, extension or with the flexion of the uh, these these things so if you any the di the definition of Chiara, of um, EDS type 3 is that they have at least a score of 4 on this on this scale now one of the things that's interesting is i always talk to people and um, you when you're sitting across the desk from the, these people, they were almost all like like this. They would they would they would sit there and talk to me like that. These are my grandchildren, and it's, this is the, the center of my life right now. But it's it, they this 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 way of looking at them is is if that's if they're spending a lot of time with their head with their chin in their and their uh, hands, then this is what they have wrong with them. So over the. Over uh, with a one-year follow-up, we have uh, had 94 fusions between 2013 and 2015, so we have a clear evidence of a, at least a one-year follow-up on all of them. 27 of those fusions were had been revisions of patients who had had prior posterior fossa decompressions and were significantly worsened after that. So that's um, uh, approximately a third, and. 25 of these had what I call Sera syndrome because I had no name for it. And I'm going to suggest that we could go now to the cervical medullary syndrome that Dr. Henderson um, told me about uh, six years ago. So what are the conditions that are associated with this that lead to the first four are things that define what I consider the Chiari, the, um, the, the Sera syndrome. They have fainting and dizzy spells, they have Postural instability, most of the people call it POTS, but POTS implies that the blood pressure doesn't change, but the pulse goes up. But most of them have postural instability, so their blood pressure drops when they stand up or sit up, and their pulse goes up by 30, 30 uh, times, 30 beats per minute. Um, they also have um, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. All of them had that. And most of them had some form of cognitive impairment. Usually it's confusional states called brain fog and memory deficits. They, many had irritable bowel syndrome. They had difficulty with initiating a urinary stream. They had all of these, these, these things. And more and more and more, it become obvious that they have these horrible immunologic things, um, including mast cell activation. So. Um, this is, this is the thing which we're talking specifically now of the cervical medullary syndrome patient or the Sera syndrome patients. 100% had a Baton score of four or more. 100% had postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or what I call uh, or, um, cardiovascular instabil instability. Uh, their memory loss and confusional states and brain fog. Um, uh, all of them had severe chronic fatigue and uh, two of the patients had mast cell dysfunction that were, was proven to have uh, mast cell dysfunction. So this is a graph of the uh, uh, clivoaxial angle changes. Um, uh, some of them were as, as uh, 110, which is like a stake into the front of the brainstem, but all of them but one had um, a, a significant improvement in the clivoaxial angle. 
and all of them had, um, for the, at the beginning of this whole thing, I was only looking at the Crab Oaks lines. I wasn't really looking at the clivoaxial angle, and that's become important. Doug Brockmeyer, in, in his discussion, uh, said that now he counts on the uh, CXA much more than the Crab Oaks line. So these are the, uh, all of the patients had some improvement in their Karnofsky scores. There were no drop-offs. And this is, uh, this graph um, is, is, is sort of amazing to me. Um, Two-thirds of the patients who had orthostatic intolerance um, had ter terrible drop in blood pressure and pulse. Two-thirds of those patients had relief of that either near, uh, most, and most of them complete relief uh, after re uh, the, um, the, the repositioning of the head and, and, the, and the decompression. Almost all of these had bone-only decompressions because if you can get more room in the, in the frame and magnum, you don't need to do a, 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 a dura opening. Some of them had uh, dural openings, but most of them didn't. Um, and the things that I was most surprised about was uh, that I, I, all of them were operated on for pain, and four out of five of those patients had significant improvement in their in their headaches and neck pain. Um, the, I, I was shocked that over half of, of the patients had improvement in their cognition after this after this surgery, and uh, half of them had marked improvement in their in their um, chronic fatigue. So I, I think all of these uh, are somewhat surprising to me. The dysautonomia other included um, problems with the peristalsis and bladder empathy and things like that. We had improvement. These are all subjective. This, these are all subjective measurements. But there are three patients who had tilt table tests which showed a dark, dramatic improvement in their tilt table tests after the, after the surgery. Now, um, a noted pediatric neurosurgeon, when we uh, gave a similar, what happened? I don't know. We gave a similar talk about uh, inter-rater reliability. Um, to the, the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery three years ago or something, and um, one guy got up and um, said that you're, you're ruining their lives. The, the amount of uh, resist, uh, ability to move your neck is, is so bad that it's, not, it's never worth doing this. So I wanted you to, to, to see, this is not the Sarah, but this is Sarah. And um, this is typical, no, not any, there were no drivers who, were dry, who um, had difficulty with the side mirrors after the, after the surgery. So in conclusion, I think that there's, this, there's some evidence. It's work in progress. It needs a lot of people, other people taking a look at it. But it, it, it seems to me that, the auto, that in the EDS type 3 patients that the autonomic nervous system can be screwed up by distortion of the anterior brainstem with the retroflexion of the odontoid and distortion of the anterior brainstem. Um, that's, in all of these patients had EDS type 3. Two, or two subsequent patients came to me with all of these things and severe neck pain and no Chiari. And um, after getting IRB approval, I did the surgery in them. I think that the Chiari in many of these patients is, is, is just how, you, how they get to the neurosurgeon. I, I don't know that, they're, that, that, that the Chiari is the problem at all. I think in many of them it is the, uh, it's the instability. Uh, and a bait and short, I think that one take home message of this is that a bait and score should be part of every, um, every uh, preoperative examination on a patient with, undergoing surgery for Chiari. And I appreciate your attention.